Hello. Welcome to A Glorious Mystery, Growing Up Spiritually. I'm so glad you've joined me, John Cavanaugh, for part three. Today, we focus on adults' faith development. We'll see how our understanding of God, our understanding of scripture, our understanding of our faith tradition changes as we go through adulthood. We'll see how these changes in faith are built on the changes that we've already considered in part one and part two. The changes in our brain that allow us to think differently as explained in the stages of cognitive development and in the ways that we think about and present ourselves in our autobiographies. So if you'll allow me just a second to share my screen, we will start our presentation of part three. Today, we will begin as usual with a bit of recap on where we've been, focusing mostly on part two, but reference back to part one as well. And then we'll dive right in into a very detailed consideration of different approaches to adults' faith development. We'll focus on two primary ways that people have done this. First, using the examples of Thomas Merton and Richard Rohr, we will look at presentations related to how we tell our story and where do we get our impetus, what matters to us. And that's the distinction between the false and true selves. Then we'll consider a few models based on stages of faith development. These will look a lot like the stages of cognitive development because in fact, they are based on the stages of cognitive development. And then we'll spend some considerable time on taking these different models of faith development and turning them into action. What do we do with them? How do we help our concept of discipleship get richer and deeper as a result of understanding how our faith is changing? How can our stages of faith development help us understand why when we read scripture over the arc of our adult lives, how we get something different out of it each time we read it, particularly if it's over the arc of years. And then we'll talk about moving to actual inaction and living out our faith. And finally, we'll talk about the, the final bit of action. We are made in the image of God and how is that helping us and, and how do we take all of the issues that we've talked about in parts one and two and three, how does that give us deeper insight into God and our tradition? So if you think back to part one, remember the assignment that was at the very end of that, and it was part of the big questions we had uh, gone over one of those big questions is related to faith development. And one of the very, very initial wonderings at the, at the beginning of our time together, did you ever wonder why it is that maybe you or other people that you know have gone from being what appears to be a very devout person to someone who questions the, the very existence of God? Do we even need God? You know, what good is it? How does that happen? How does that transition from devout, church-going, deeply religious, deeply believing in God go to someone who questions the very existence, the very need for religion and, and faith in the first place? And how do people ultimately reach resolution about their faith? How do they go from this questioning phase to maybe a, a different kind of depth, a different kind of commitment to their religious tradition and, and their personal faith. So in part two, we emphasized and, and discovered that our brains are wired for efficiency through 
heuristics and biases, those things that help us be quick and efficient as thinkers. Not a lot of conscious, if any, conscious effort at all. We are many times completely unaware of the things that we're doing. We could, for example, be driving down a highway, go 10 miles without even realizing that we did it because our mind has wandered somewhere else because driving is something that we're very, very good at. We're monitoring the key pieces of information, other cars on the highway and so on and so forth without the least little bit of conscious effort. We learned about the three general stages of thinking that are possible in adulthood, absolutist, relativistic uncertainty, and principled certainty. The fact that progression through these stages is not guaranteed, not everybody does it, and no one, no one uses the highest possible level all the time because it's just too much work. We tend to default to the one that's most comfortable that gets the job done and deals with the issue at hand in a quick and dirty and quick and efficacious way. We wrapped part two with the consideration of personality development by focusing on the core issues that we confront. Um, Eric Erickson talked about going through um, issues related to developing close intimate relationships with other people at an emotional level. The, need to look after and mentor and bring along the next generation in ways through work, through ways of raising children, grandchildren, and so forth. And finally, um, a focus on our life stories, how we tell our autobiography, how we answer the question that somebody might ask us. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Where do we start? What do we emphasize? So that brings us now to the case of what happens with our faith. So as people over the years have thought about faith development, and remember back to St. Paul, even St. Paul talked about faith development, that as an adult, he didn't do things like he did as a child. The wisdom literature talks a lot about the fact that wisdom comes with age, that older people have a perspective. They set up their governments based on what we call gerontocracies were a group of elders that had that experience. So our models are grounded in those understandings, but they are particularly grounded in cognitive and personality development. Our understanding is much deeper than it, it used to be. Faith development mirrors the modes of thinking and the core issues that we confront at specific points along our developmental trajectories. So as we get deeper into these approaches, these models of faith development, you're gonna feel right at home because we looked at the foundational building blocks in part two, cognitive development and personality development. So let's spend some time on a couple of different kinds of models of faith development. The first is based on how we face the core issues, what matters to us most, what is important, what do we deal with, what are, what are we concerned about? And the second um, are really tightly tied to those modes of thinking, those stages of cognitive development. So let's look at the ones on based on core issues. So <clears throat> the two major proponents that we'll focus on today of this approach are Thomas Merton, the famous Trappist monk in the, of the 20th century, and Richard Rohr, who has straddled the 20th century and uh, writes uh, daily reflection pieces. And all many of you may have, have, have read his work as well as Merton's work uh, and may be somewhat familiar with both of these individuals. Their major approach to faith development pivots around two concepts, what they call the false self and what they call the true self. <clears throat> Both Merton and Rohr see the origins of this distinction in scripture um, and refer back to Jesus' teaching and other parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament as 
informing their explanations and their understanding of how faith develops. So let's take false self first. Merton in some of his early writings and certainly Richard Rohr in several of his books and in many of his daily columns, flesh out what they understand the false self to be. To them, the false self is who you think you are. And it's just a social and a mental construct. It's the persona, the mask, the story that you tell others, your representation of what you want other people to know about you, what you want them to understand about you, and it may likely not be complete and may not really reflect your deepest held beliefs, your deepest held values. Both Merton and Rohr go to great lengths in their, in their writings to say that the false self represents what they call the trappings of the ego. It's heavily colored by your appearance, your educational attainment, your job, how much money you have, your success, your recognition, social media terms, the number of followers you have, um, the number of people you influence, the number of people who retweet you. In short, the focus of the false self is on external sources of motivation, and reward and the illusion that you're autonomous or what they call the autonomous self, that you are in control, that you make the decisions, that what you decide is, can be completely separate from whatever other influences might be out there, that your free will and your free will alone makes the difference. In psychology, we have a concept called the illusion of control. You might think that you are in control of any given particular situation, but not really. There may well be other forces, other um, things that are important, other people who actually are more in true control than, than you are. But the interesting thing about the false self is that it really allows us to function every day in society because of the fact that it's a function of our ego. It's the false self that's really quite good at setting boundaries. So you'll let people in this far and no further. But keep in mind that what makes you tick is not much from the internal stuff of your values, your principles, things of that sort. Um, and what you tell about yourself, how you answer the question, tell me a little bit about yourself. What makes you proud? It's far more likely that you're gonna give a list of accomplishments at work, the awards that you've won um, and so on, than you are to talk about here are the principles on which I stand. I used to ask <clears throat> job applicants a question on what hill are you willing to die as a way to try to get at, has the person thought about these issues? And do they have a sense of self from that perspective? And interestingly enough, even at, at the executive level, over half of the people did not have an answer to that question because their self-definition was so structured around their ego and those external sources of reward. At some point, both Merton and Rohr say that living your life that way starts to not feel good. It starts to feel like a pair of shoes that don't fit too well. Um, um, a, a, an itchy shirt. Uh, it's that nagging and doubt that start creeping back in. Remember them from, from part one and part two? They are the motivators. You wake up one morning and say to yourself, is this all there is? Or you start thinking about you've got fewer years left to live probably than you have already lived. Or you start to think about retirement and you say to yourself, gee, 
Um, what am I going to do with myself? Or what legacy am I going to leave? When you start to ask those kinds of questions, you start to look at your life, not so much from the awards and accomplishments and income and things of that sort, but rather what Merton and Ward talk about is your inherent identity, your soul's image, your soul self, the blueprint that has been lurking back there, but not really visible that you've had for your life. In faith terms, it's who you are in God and who God is in you. It's your partnership with God. At the title that you have on the door to your office or on your Zoom screen, but what really deep inside makes you tick. You think back to our section in part two on life story. This is the part that you start really putting your values and your principles out first. And Merton and, and Rohr talk a lot about this notion that the true self emerges from what's called a death to self. And here we can see one of the ties that they made to the gospels. Jesus talked a lot about, if you really want to follow me, you must die to your self to follow me. The death to self that Jesus was talking about was the death to the false self and the putting on of the true self. So the progression that Merton and Rohr are talking about is a progression from an externally focused, other people um, in a sense being in the driver's seat to help you construct the meaning to your, of your life. And moving from that, dying to that false self and taking on, putting on the new self that is really reflective of your inner values, your inner principles and your relationship with God, God in you and you in God. So let's take a look at a different way of describing adults' faith development that is much more grounded in the cognitive developmental stages. These reflect increasingly complex ways of having faith and practicing your faith and expressing your faith. Most of the people who have worked in this particular area all agree that there are a few qualitative shifts across adulthood, just like there are a few shifts in the way we think. Because of the very tight links with cognitive development, you can use those stages of cognitive development to understand the issues and challenges in discipleship, evangelization, and debates about issues in your faith tradition. So we're gonna see how the, the fundamental way in which you think is reflected in the way you approach your faith and how you approach your faith drives the way in which you're going to practice discipleship, you're going, you practice or engage in evangelization, how you approach other people. So there are lots of examples that I've mentioned, but we're gonna focus on the two most widely known. We're gonna focus on James Fowler and Brian McLaren. Now you may remember that James Fowler was the one that I gave you the little preview about in part one. So we're gonna come back to Fowler now in, in detail, and we're gonna see how McLaren um, riffs on that a little bit and, and straddles some of, of Fowler's stages and, and develops it a little bit further. But both of them have in common those ultimate drivers of change, nagging and doubt. They are the motivators that push you from one stage to the next. So let's take a closer look at James Fowler's model. Now, James Fowler was the first person to really map out a stage theory of faith development. 
And this was about 40 or so years ago. Um, and he built it on the back, by this point, of the emerging research literature on how adult thinking changes. So in Fowler's model, um, we're not only going to focus on the adult stages. He has some separate st stages in childhood. Um, but none of those um, carry through to adulthood in, in, on, a, on a usual basis. So we're going to focus on the four that once you reach these, you can stay there for the rest of your life, or you can continue to explore your faith um, a, a little bit deeper and, and differently. The initial stage that Fowler talks about um, in terms of, of adulthood is what he calls synthetic and conventional faith. This usually starts to come in in adolescence. Um, and its characteristics are that group identification is really important. Um, if you think about adolescents for a minute in, in the social realm and things, they tend to form cliques or groups or in groups, out groups, and, and so on. Same is true in faith development. You want to find people, you gravitate toward people whose faith is similar to yours. Syn synthetic and conventional faith relies on external authority. That could be the Pope. It could be um, a, a local priest or minister. It could be uh, someone on the national scene um, that, that has a, a TV show. It could be someone on social media. Just like in absolutist thinking, the authority figure can be anyone or any trusted source. Um, so a, a, a TV network example, EWTN. Um, the key thing here is that wherever that comes from, you believe what they tell you. You have an unquestioned commitment to that, to that group or that organization or that parish or that denomination. And in synthetic and conventional faith, you just cannot conceive of any other system or interpretation. This is the one true and only way to understand God, faith, sin, justice, and so on. So this is it. And the goal here for people at this level is to get other people to think like them. Um, conversion is, is a big emphasis here um, because you understand that anyone who is not of your faith needs to be brought into your faith in order to be saved, if that's your belief system. A second stage that Fowler talks about um, that you, you can achieve and stay in for the, for the rest of your life <clears throat> is what he calls individuative reflective faith. This come, can come in late adolescence, usually in their 20s, in one's 20s. Um, think about what's going on at this point. This is when your prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead is starting to work more, starting to get deeper connected to your emotional centers in your brain. Um, and cognitively across the board, we're starting to be able to think about other facets, other ways of looking at things. So in individual tip and reflective faith, Fowler says, this is a time of disequilibrium. We don't look to only one source. We don't have just one way of looking at things. So in the absence of a trusted external authority, the authority becomes you. So this is kind of the flip side, the 180 degree opposite of synthetic conventional. It's a time of individuality. It's self-exploration. You wanna try things out. It's a time of independence. Um, and self-fulfillment. You're highly likely to question everything and also quite likely to reject what you used to practice. So if you were a very devout person, if you move into the individual to reflective faith stage, you're, you're quite likely to stop going to church, to stop believing in God in the way you're used to, stop believing in organized religion, question the authority of 
of the Pope, question the authority of the teachings of the church and say, hey, I, I need to explore. So you, you may visit other denominations. You may attend services in another Christian or non-Christian church. You may explore um, uh, things like Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, other kinds of, of religious practice, get into other forms of religious practice to see what it's like. Because there's no one that you can go talk to and really trust like you can your own experience. So you need to go have those experiences. You need to question your former beliefs to do two things. One, to test them out, to test whether or not they're true, test whether these other people that you've been noticing but were um, saying that they were wrong before, well, maybe they might have something. Maybe something that the Dalai Lama wrote appeals to you, so you go and check it out. The key thing in individual to reflective faith is that every faith is equally okay, Every way of looking at it is equally okay. Um, morality is relative to the situation all the time, not just some of the time. There are no universal principles and nothing, including God, or sometimes especially God, is truly knowable. If now you can doubt, kick in again. Fowler says there's a possibility you might move to what he calls conjunctive faith. In Fowler's view, this simply does not happen until you start approaching middle age, certainly no earlier than, than one's 30s, because you need those more elaborate connections in the brain. You need more practice in looking at things and rotating and looking at different facets. So, a key thing here is that you're now more willing to accept diversity, accept the fact that some things are just really complicated, accept the fact that some things are knowable and some things are just mystery, and some things are just paradox, that's okay. In some cases, what this leads to is you go back and reaffirm beliefs you held earlier in your life, but now you have a different reason for believing them because you've gone and you've checked out other points of view. You may have participated. You may have converted to another religion. You may come back, but now you can say, you know what? I looked, I tried it out. It didn't do as much for me as my original one. And perhaps that's because I now have a deeper understanding. You're much more willing now to just let reality be. You don't have to have an answer. Answers might be available. There is a truth. Things can be known, but sometimes you just don't need to know. It's okay. So regardless of the impact on your self-esteem or whatever. Sometimes you can, you can feel, uh, some people might feel a little foolish for having meandered around, um, but the coming back gives you the anchor again and it's okay. And you just say, you know what? It's okay. I needed for myself to find out. I did. And now my Catholic faith or whatever this may be, means so much more to me. I have a much deeper and, and richer appreciation. I understand the ritual in a whole new way. And so that is mine and I'm, I now make a commitment to that. Fowler's final stage, which he says only a few people ever get because it takes so much work and so much effort, is what he calls universalizing faith. In a real sense, this is countercultural. This is not looking for belonging in the usual sense of the term. So being Catholic or being Jewish or being Muslim or being Buddhist is not as important 
as seeing the universal truths that link all of those faith traditions. So for people in the universalizing faith stage, they see everyone, irrespective of the organizational alignment that they have or commitment that they have, they see everyone as part of the universal family. Everyone is a child of God, no matter how they practice, no matter what, that's not the important part. The fact that everyone is a child of God is what matters. People at this stage also serve others selflessly. They love life because it is a gift of God, but they are not attached to life. What does this mean? It means that these are people who are willing to, as it says in scripture, lay down one's life for one's friend. Because you understand that at, at this level, there are certain universal principles, like the goodness that is in each of us from God, the fact that each of us is made in the image of God is what is the glue that holds us together. And if there is a threat to that universal principle, you are willing to sacrifice your life so that others may continue to experience that higher order principle. So another person that talked a lot about stages of faith is Brian McLaren. <clears throat> In McLaren's stage model, he also has a stage that refers only to, to childhood, which we're not gonna focus on here because he also argues that one does not go through the rest of one's life there usually. And so for McLaren, the first stage that one can go through um, all of adulthood with is what he calls complexity. The characteristics of McLaren's stage of complexity is that everything is knowable. The authorities that you pay attention to are the people who know how to do it. So they are the experts, if you will. You don't ask the question, nor do you care, how do they become expert? <clears throat> and for you, there's no difference between people who actually study and become expert through education or, or some based on evidence or whatever, and people who just declare themselves as experts. Um, they're all authority figures as far as you're concerned, as long as, as they're giving you information that fits with the way you think. In the complexity stage, um, bad people are the people who don't do the right thing, where the right thing is whatever that authority figure has told you how you behave, anybody else who does something different is a bad person, is a sinner, um, and is wrong. So the name of the game in the complexity stage is learn the rules and play to win. The person who demonstrates faith the most is the holiest person. So a common image of God in McLaren's complexity stage is as the ultimate coach. Because if you think about coaches who are trying to get the your best out of you, get your best performance out of you, in the world of faith, God is the ultimate coach saying to you, come on, I know you can be just a little bit more devout. I know you can do a little bit more in terms of your prayer life. So it's always pushing you to achieve a bit more. There is less emphasis on the quality of it, the meaning behind it, um, and in the intentions. It's more about the external uh, demonstration of it and that very bright line between um, good people are doing the 
the right thing and playing by the rules and bad people are everybody else. If nagging and doubt come in and this isn't that you, you get a sense, this just isn't working too well for you. McLaren says that you may proceed to the next stage in adulthood called perplexity. And McLaren describes perplexity it's kind of like it sounds. It's relativistic and borders sometimes on cynical, but it has the advantage of asking honest questions. It's that, excuse me, that, that questioning phase again. In the perplexity stage, McLaren says nothing is knowable for sure. There is no ultimate truth. And to the opposite of complexity, authority figures are the enemy because they try to impose easy answers on otherwise naive people. So this is a stage of rebelling against authority, whoever that might be, whether it's the Pope, um, a, a priest, um, some other authority figure, uh, mainstream media, whatever that happens to be, whoever that authority happens to be. Authorities are evil, they are the enemy, um, they're trying to brainwash you, and in, a and in that sense, because God is the ultimate authority, I've outgrown God. So in, in this stage, a common approach is God is what I outgrew. I used to need him as a crutch. I don't need God anymore. Or depending on who you read, um, 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 you're, you're seeking something or religion is the opiate of the masses. The key aspect here is that it's, a it's just an across the board initial rejection. It could be searching for something that seems right for you, but it may not be a search that ever ends because there is no ultimate yes. There's no ultimate truth since you can't know anything for sure. So the danger that McLaren talks about with perplexity is people can get stuck here in a very cynical way, reject everything and just head off on the exit ramp um, and never really resolve any of the questions that, that they've asked. And that has some potentially um, difficult issues to deal with um, because it can be not a happy place to, to end up um, from, a, from a, a personal perspective. More often than not, people don't get that far. They just try things out. So they'll, they'll um, practice a different faith for a while. They'll change. They may, they, they may step out. They may come back into something else. So they, they sort of um, do the, the cafeteria buffet approach. The final stage that McLaren talks about in his model is what he calls harmony. McLaren talks about harmony as, as a, a time when you focus on a few essentials that are true. You've distilled down your searching. You've whittled it down. You've prioritized it. There are, in fact, some things that are knowable. Some things aren't. They're just, it's a mystery. But you're okay with that. You're okay with paradox. There's no us versus them. There's, because there's no them, there's only us. And everyone is us. You come to a position of highly valuing and understanding universal love of self and neighbor. That's the glue that holds the us together. You deeply understand the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, because there is no difference. You come to a point of seeing life is what you make it with God's help. You don't have that illusion of control that you did earlier on. You and God have a co-creative partnership. It's a very different approach than God is going to intervene in your life. God is, an, is the ultimate authority. All you need to do is ask and you will receive and you take that quite literally. So at this level, your thinking is very integrated and synthesized. It's, it's a wholeness. Everything is one. 
So let's do a side-by-side -side with Fowler and McLaren for their adult stages. McLaren's complexity stage straddles Fowler's synthetic conventional and the beginnings of the individuative reflective. Okay? So if you think about it, both of them are um, firmly rooted in uh, clear authority figures, absolute truth, um, clear boundaries, a bright line between right and wrong, correct, wrong. The good people are on the right side, the bad people are on not. McLaren's perplexity, questioning phase, straddles Fowler's individuative, reflective, and conjunctive phases. You're checking stuff out. You're not sure. Nothing is really knowable. Um, the danger here is to uh, take it a little too far and become cynical about most everything. And finally, uh, McLaren's harmony and Fowler's universalizing stages are very, very similar. Um, it's the universal truths, it's the universal principles, the boundaries across different faith traditions disappear. Um, and you see things from the point of view, you're willing to lay down your life for those principles so that others don't need to do that. So there is a great deal of similarity between the four stages in adulthood of Fowler and the three of McLaren. So with those understandings, the, the false self, true self, and the stage approaches that, that we've considered, let's move now from models to actions. We're gonna consider four questions. First, what do the models of faith tell us? Second, how can we use the models of faith development and the underlying foundations, cognitive development, our writing of our life stories and so on, to understand our own faith and our own faith community. Third, how do the models inform our understanding of scripture? And fourth, how do the models inform our understanding of discipleship? So let's consider what do the models of faith development tell us? Well, for one thing, we need to ascertain where people are in order to understand them. Just because they're an adult, we don't know much more than that. We really need to understand from a cognitive developmental perspective, are they an absolutist thinker? Are they a, a, a principle thinker and so on? In Fowler's stages, where are they on Fowler stages or McLaren st stages? Only then can we really understand how they think and how to best engage. Remember that conversation we had in part two on how to engage people at different levels of thinking. So to connect, we need to match or only slightly stretch where the person is. So if the person is at the conventional level, we can't go, we can't talk to them as if, um, you know, they're at the universalizing level because their understanding of those principles is not going to be the same as ours. We need to meet them where they are, but the where is where on the developmental trajectory because the person's understanding of God, our understanding of God, what or who is an authority, whether truth is even knowable, and if so, how many credible versions are there, and whether the meaning of one's life, the meaning of faith is even sought, depends crucially on what stage they are. Again, if we're comparing someone at the universalizing and conventional levels, a conventional person is going to look at God as the ultimate authority. So a prayer life may be much more of a supplicant model than a peer-to-peer -peer model. So we've got to understand <clears throat> we meet people where they are, and we need to kind of through talking with them, figure out the stage. So if we look at um, a, a person's willingness to, to be active, to go out, to, to be a disciple, to, be, uh, to, to evangelize, or to be an activist on certain issues of morals and ethics, different, different stages are more or less activist in orientation, right? 
It turns out that the, sta the, the first stage and the last stage are the most activist stages. Why is that? Because <clears throat> at the absolute thinking stage, there's only one right way to do it. And you need to convince other people and convert them to your point of view. Because there's only one right way of looking at it, and that's yours. So many of the people who are in um, marches, for example, are, are people who see the world that way. By the same token, a lot of people in those marches are people at the principled certainty level. Why? Because they've, in fact, got the ability to do the analysis necessary to look at an issue from all different facets, really look at the evidence, argue it back and forth, have what Aaron, remember Aaron's two-in-one dialogue around issues and the different sides of it, and then draw a conclusion. And once they draw that conclusion, they are deeply committed to it. In fact, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between absolutist and principled certainty thinkers around issues pertaining to activism until you really sit and talk to them about how did you get it also turns out that most people act at the lowest stage most of the time. So most of the time, our faith in action is going to look like absolutist or conventional. <clears throat> it's not gonna look like harmony because it takes so much effort. As I've talked about already, each model has a danger aspect that could result in your getting stuck in a, in a not good way. One can be a very comfortable practitioner of reasoning or of faith at that level and, and not get over into the, the, the downsides of, of each of those. One can um, uh, use to one's advantage the ability to ask all those questions um, without becoming overly cynical. So all of this, including a full-blown crisis of faith, is expected and understood to be part of the process. What the models of faith tell us is that it is a developmental process to go from being a very devout person to a person who might even reject the existence of God. It's a normal developmental process. So how do we use the models to understand the self and community? Well, first off, there is no perfect stage. We already understand that. Each one has its, has its upside and its downside, its pros and its cons. Usually one stage will resonate with you best with your current beliefs and understandings, and you're going to stick with it because it takes so much energy, and a lot of doubt and nagging to get you to move. Faith communities also have parallel developmental trajectories. An entire parish can go through these stages. There's also a tension between catering to the typical or average versus appropriately challenging people to grow. You can push too hard and people will be turned off. We also have to understand that any parish community is going to have people at every stage. The trick is to figure out who is where so that when you start a program, for example, or an outreach effort, you get the right match, as we've talked about already and thought through, we get the right match of where they are on their faith journey and how you are trying to, to talk with them. So understanding that members who are in the questioning or relativist stage need support for their questioning or they will surely leave. Remember, the questioning is part of their developmental process. They're trying to figure out what is, is the best approach for them. They are on a journey. Tr telling them that that's not okay is not going to be very effective. Remember those, those things that, that we talked about in terms of how do you make those matches? How do you best approach people at different levels of thinking? 
we meet people where they are and, and we value them for who they are and where they are, those interactions will bear fruit. So how do our models inform our understanding of scripture? I already gave a hint on, on how Jesus talks about things and the death to self and everything. Well, if you read God, the gospels carefully, Jesus operates within his true self, his parables, the language he uses, um, the paradoxes that he talks about all the time. So Jesus operates at the highest stage. He's one of these few people who can do that a lot, which also explains a lot. It, it, I, I talked about already what, how this all fits with his references to dying to self, dying to the false self, why his parables and teachings are full of paradox, that he'll be last and so on, why forgiveness and reconciliation are central to his teaching. That only works for people from different um, perspectives if you are at the universalizing level. Samaritans and Jews were not seen as okay to be together unless you are at the universalizing level, in which case the distinction between Samaritans and Jews vanishes. This also helps explain why he really was so countercultural. He was all the time consorting with the others, tax collectors, um, sinners, uh, people of, uh, of, of, who had leprosy, um, who, who were outcasts for various reasons, right? He intentionally violated the law in service of a higher good. He healed on the Sabbath and was considered work, which was taboo. But at the universalizing level of faith, those rules are subservient to the higher order principles. And those were really the crux of his teachings. So that is why, a big reason why, the gospel message is so very hard to live every day and how it's so easily bent to other understandings because you can understand something like dying to self in a very different way and make it part of a bright line and you can bring it into the fact that maybe you don't see an outright ban on the right of one human to own another human. So you, you don't have a higher order principle that enslavement is not a good thing and is wrong. So you can bend the gospel or you can interpret the gospel in many different ways. So finally, how do the models inform our understandings of discipleship? Discipleship is clearly a central goal of faith. Discipleship is rooted in the stages of faith development, which are, as we know, built on the stages of cognitive development in our life stories. So discipleship itself means something different at each stage. There is no one definition. There's no one way to do it. It depends on where you are. The problem is that none of the most popular models of discipleship that you might read about in the popular literature take developmental change into account. If we're going to meet people where they are, and we're going to meet people where they are in their faith development, and we're going to talk about discipleship, we need to match the understanding of discipleship and contextualize it with their developmental state. So what we might all want to think about is how we might create in the Newman Center maybe a new, deeper, blended model of discipleship based on our understandings of what it really means to meet people where they are in terms of their faith development. So, the end of part three, what have we learned? Well, the four important things that I would see here for part three is that change in faith, our understanding of faith is, happens. It's normal. It's 
grounded in our genetics all the way up to how our brains are wired, how we think, how we understand things. Adults cycle from times where you're absolutely certain about the way things work to you are the absolute opposite. You are completely uncertain about how anything works. Back to certainty, but with different understandings each time. When you come back to certainty, <clears throat> it's not the same certainty you had before. It's a certainty based on life experience and analysis of evidence. You've put those other beliefs that you've held and positions that you've held to the test, to the test of reality, to the test of your experience, to the test of facts and evidence. Each stage, whether it's cognitive development, personal development, or a faith development, has benefits and serious dangers if we're not careful. But the biggest takeaway I hope you, you get is that to fully encounter another person and to support that person's growth, we must connect at their stage where they are and help them develop and excel at a two-in-one dialogue. You can do that at every stage, even absolutist, if you do it where they are in the way that they think, using the logic structures that they use, you can nudge, you can nag, and you can plant that first mustard seed of doubt and let that mustard seed grow. So I'd like to leave you with four of my favorite quotes that relate to faith development in action that you can apply to any kind of development in adulthood. The first, I wanna loop back to the, to the um, section of 1 Corinthians I first raised in, in part one. When Paul said, when I was a child, I used to talk like a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became an adult, I put aside childish things. John Stuart Mill said, those who know only their own side of the case knows little of that. Their reasons may be good and no one may have been able to refute them. But if they are equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if they do not so much as know what they are, they have no ground for preferring either opinion. Isaiah Berlin, <clears throat> another philosopher, said, few things have done more harm than the belief on the part of individuals or groups or tribes or states or nations or churches that he or she or they are in sole possession of the truth, especially about how to live and what to be and do, and that those who differ from them are not merely mistaken, but wicked or mad and need restraining or suppressing. And finally, to bring it back to the gospels, for whoever wishes to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it from Matthew's gospel. We've considered a glorious mystery. The door to continued growth opens when we allow that nagging and doubt that we feel to become legitimate alternatives, to show us a way. At the highest stage, we are finally comfortable with understanding and accepting that some things are just a glorious mystery and we revel living in so keep wondering and embrace your nagging and doubt. Thank you so much for your attention across these three talks. Please stay in touch as questions occur to you or you start feeling the tug of nagging or you're doubting about something, feel free to email me. Send your questions or comments back to me at globaljcc at gmail.com, the email address you see right here. 
I really would like to thank you for having the opportunity to spend some time together. I wish you peace. I wish you gentle days ahead. Thank you very much. God bless.